Christian Community Church. You guys can have a seat. Good to see everybody today. It's uh, just, just fun to see, just be with, uh, with, be with the uh, church family. It really is. Um, hey, well, one uh, quick thing here. So if you are a uh, new uh, kind of uh, folks coming into the church, um, first time guests, uh, I do want you to take a look back at the back, the Welcome Center. 
Uh, we have uh, a free gift for you if you want to come back there after the uh, church service is over. I'd love to meet you, get to know you a little bit, and uh, give you a free gift. So it's a good deal. Um, also, back in the back there, we have the sermon notes for kids. There's a few different uh, little uh, uh, sheets there. So if you do have kids and they want to follow along for the sermon, there's uh, a few different styles there. This one, maybe if adults would like to use this too. We have uh, write or draw something you've heard in the sermon today. Um, today I was confused or had a hard time believing something, Dan said. Well, maybe that's you. Anyway, uh, there's uh, sheets back here uh, for, for the kids and for the adults if you'd like. Um, this week, from an announcement standpoint, just normal kind of activities that we've started back up. But I do want to draw your attention to two things that are coming up in just a couple of weeks. Uh, so one is Sunday, July 26th will be the annual church picnic. So that's not this coming Sunday, but the next one. Um, so instead of being here at this campus, uh, we will be at Adams Township Park at 11 a.m. So the church service followed by a picnic. Those that have been there before uh, um, kind of got the idea. It will be a little different this year just because everything's different this year. Um, but uh, so each family will bring your own picnic lunch, kind of your own family, rather than doing the buffet style. And uh, do bring lawn chairs, blankets to sit on, that kind of deal. Uh, bring, you know, yard games if uh, you want to set those out. Uh, make sure you label them. Uh, it's kind of like crockpot lids. Like, nobody goes home with their same crockpot lid from church events and stuff. But anyway, um, so label your games, and uh, you can hopefully take them home as well. Um, the other event that is coming up, which is pretty exciting, is Wednesday evening, August 5th. We're having a family fun event here at the church. Uh, that's, uh, I think, from, what is it, 6 to 8, something like that. So there'll be more information coming out about it. It'll be an outdoor event, uh, kind of a VBS style kind of deal, but instead of kind of a drop your kids off and, and uh, that kind of thing, just hard logistically to do that, um, it's gonna be kind of a family event, right? So it's not just uh, kids that can come, it's uh, you know, kids of all ages that can, uh, can come and enjoy this too. Um, so crafts, games, music, that kind of stuff. Uh, we will be having a family registration in the uh, next couple weeks here to get a better feel of who else is coming so we can plan for that. Uh, but also wanted to make sure folks knew that uh, volunteers are needed. Uh, Nicole sent out an email with a uh, link to sign up in Breeze. Uh, if you have trouble doing that or would rather just talk to Bethany, Bethany is over here. Wave your hand, Bethany. There you go. You can talk to Bethany, and uh, she'd love to have you volunteer as well. Um, again, trying to you know, respect the whole social density thing and, and the way we're putting this on, but uh, excited to have an event uh, for the kids and, and uh, uh, just a, a good time for families to come together. Um, I think that's it for announcements. So we'll transition over to our uh, Marvel and Expect verse for today. It's been kind of our theme for the church this year, uh, marveling at God and kind of then uh, expecting right of what he's going to do. I really saw those themes both in uh, Psalm 63, uh, which I was reading this past week. It doesn't use exactly the words marvel and expect. Those themes are there throughout the entire psalm. And first, in verses 2 through 3, we see David really marveling at the character of God. It says, So I have looked upon you in the sanctuary, beholding your power and your glory. Because of your steadfast love is better than life, my lips will praise you. You see him marveling at the glory of God in those things and the attributes of God. But then, in verse 5, notice what David expects based on what he knows to be true about the character of God. It says, My soul will be satisfied as with fat and rich food. My mouth will praise you with joyful lips. Um, you know, Bethany always uh, kids me whenever I'm uh, going to uh, eat something, uh, maybe a dessert, something like that, or going to a nice restaurant. Um, she'll, she'll always watch me because when I, when I eat something I really like, I'll take a bite, and as I'm savoring it, I'll twirl my fork. I have no idea why I do this. I'll twirl my fork. She always looks to see if I'm twirling my fork to know if I really, really like what I'm eating, right? And I thought about that. My soul will be satisfied as with rich and fat food, and my mouth will praise you. It's, it's almost like God is so good and so savory that I'm, I'm twirling my fork as I'm enjoying who he is, right? You, you get that picture in your mind? That's, that's how satisfying God is. So what do you expect today as you engage in relationship with the God of this universe, in this worship service, and, and beyond, in your homes and wherever you're going? Do you intimately know his power, his glory, and his love? And do you expect for your soul to be satisfied by him today? David did. And the same God that he served a couple thousand years ago is the same soul-satisfying God who is here yesterday, today, and forever. So marvel at his character today. 
Expect for him to satisfy your soul's deepest needs and then savor him as he does just that. Let's pray and we'll continue in worship. Heavenly Father, Lord, again, more than ever, Lord, just what a privilege it is to be here with a community of believers, God. Lord, we, we do come before you, Lord. We come before you in worship, through song, or through giving, as we can give in the, in the back or, or wherever else, Lord, but, and then through the through hearing of your word. Lord, it's a beautiful thing to savor your character, to expect, not just to go through the same old, same old, but Lord, to expect that you know, you're living. Your word is living and active in, in our, our lives today. Lord, help us, Lord, as we continue in worship, to have our minds, attention, and our hearts, affection directed at you. We love you. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Good morning, everyone. Do you want to please stand as we enter a time of worship?
darkness tries to roll over my bones when sorrow comes to steal the joy I own when brokenness and pain is all I know I won't be shaken I won't be shaken my fear doesn't stand a chance You may be seated, and good morning to you. Thank you, Curtis, for leading the way today. Much appreciated, but it is good to see you here this morning, as well as those watching at home. Looking forward to our annual church picnic in just two Sundays from today. Appreciated Tim giving us some announcement about that this morning. There's been an email out about that as well. If you have questions, be sure to just talk to us, and we'll help answer those as we know it's a unique time for that, but looking forward to spending that time together. We're also working on a plan um, for anybody that would be missing the live stream that morning. Our live stream equipment will not be at the picnic in two weeks, so we're working on something uh, recorded earlier in the week to put out as well, so we're not missing something that Sunday at 11, but let me take care of a couple things. Tim, here's a fork, just in case you hear something good this morning. Um, Figure... That'll be a good sign for me, uh, kind of work as a, a new, new amen, maybe. And um, let's see, Miriam, you want to stand up for us, honey? This is Miriam. Miriam turned eight today, so happy birthday to Miriam, right? Awesome. High five. Nice. Very good. Very cool. All right. 
Well, listen, we are on the third week of our summer series. Uh, it's called the Marvel Series, and as Tim was telling you a little bit earlier, we have two theme words for 2020 as a church, and those words are Marvel and expectation. Marvel being a worship word. We marvel at who God is and what he has done, and that also brings us to a place of expectation, which is a faith word. We believe that God is not finished yet. God is still alive and well. He's working today, and he promises to continue to work for all eternity. But we're looking at the word marvel, in particular through the life and teaching of Jesus Christ. And so to do that, we've given our attention to the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And quite honestly, the word marvel appears over and over and over again. Now, you might say that that's just a given, right? We're talking about Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God. And if there's anyone to marvel about, it's Jesus. And so we marvel at what he's done, we marvel at what he has said, and we find actually too that Jesus himself along the way will marvel at some things. And there's good things to marvel at, there's also some negative things to marvel at, and we'll get into more of those as the summer continues. Now, last Sunday morning, we looked at marveling at the power of Jesus. And with the help of some gospel accounts, we were witness to Jesus' power over nature, his power over disease. In fact, the Bible said that Jesus healed every kind of disease and every kind of sickness. We also learned that Jesus had power over the demonic, that at the power of his word, he could cast the demon away. But ultimately, last Sunday morning, we learned that Jesus has power over sin, that his power over nature, his power over disease, his power over the demonic is all a sign to us that Jesus holds power over sin and that because of a perfect Savior and what he's done for us at the cross, if we exercise our faith in Jesus, we are saved, forgiven of our sin. Two Sundays ago, as we began our series, it was a bit of a Christmas message, Luke chapter 2, and we found that even from the beginning, Those who witnessed Jesus from the very day of his birth, as they spoke about him, they did so with such marvel. And those that heard the witness of those speakers marveled at what they heard about Jesus. This is what has been said about him. But today, and you can see from our title screen, this morning we're looking at marveling at the words of Jesus. So this morning, it's not marveling at what was said about him, but today we marvel at his own words. There are plenty of them, right? I mean, we could spend Sunday after Sunday after Sunday, and in a way, I've bitten off well more than I can chew on this morning. And in fact, it's, it's gonna feel like we're skirting some of the teaching this morning, But hang with me, because I want you to see the way that people responded to his teaching. Because after all, that's what Marvel is all about. A stirring within our heart and a stirring within our mind that we too have been captured by the Savior. Well, our word marvel is Strong's word, 2296. And what's that mean? It means that Strong's is a dictionary of Bible words. Gives you the Hebrew words from the Old Testament, gives you the Greek words from the New Testament. If you had a Strong's concordance, I got a big one in my office. You can go play with it later if you want, okay? Or you can look it up online in this day and age and find all that you need. It's Strong's number 2296. It's the word thalmadzo, and you can even see on the screen how it's written in the Greek language, for those of you that like that sort of thing, okay? To wonder or to marvel at something or someone that is the marvel, or as we're looking at it in this series, of course, Jesus as the marvel, but we're the ones privileged to respond with marvel 
to the Savior. But my favorite part of this definition slide is the words that you see italicized there. See, we're opening our eyes and our ears as avenues to our heart that we might marvel at Jesus, and doing so, we're ratcheting up our attention, our imagination, our affection, our fascination, and even our obsession with Jesus. You remember when they used to call the followers of Jesus, Jesus freaks? And then DC Talk sang about it, right? You remember that? Some of us are old enough to remember that, right? And you know, that's okay. That's the whole point of marveling at Jesus. If you're gonna be a freak about something, be a Jesus freak. Enough about that. That wasn't even in my notes. I don't know where that came from, right? The point being, this summer as we look at all this is a freedom a freedom as God's people, man. And you're tired of me talking about 2020. I know you are, right? And the craziness that is this year. But if we could get our eyes off the circumstances of what's happening and get our eyes on Jesus, I'll tell you, he will lift the burden. I will tell you there is freedom. So give yourself to marveling. You see, many of us are marveling at what's happening in our world. We've never seen anything like this. And it, it's nervous and it scares us and it's anxiety ridden. And so we're marveling in all sort of the bad sense at what's happening. So look then at something that can make you marvel in a way that will just stir your spirit with such incredible joy and peace. And that's Jesus. And so that's what this sermon series all summer, whether looking at the power of Jesus or like today, the words of Jesus, or even next Sunday, the testimony of those that encountered Jesus, we will learn to marvel and we will be free to marvel. Don't let the world tell you that you can't because they will try to silence you and shush you. They'll tell you as Christians, you need to be quiet about this. It might even offend some people. I tell you, don't even worry about that. Speak up and be joyful about what Jesus has done and what he is yet to do and what he's doing even now. You go ahead and marvel at him and let the world see you marvel at him. So let's pray. Then we're gonna look at three passages, John 7, Matthew 7, and then Mark 10, maybe a couple other stops along the way to learn to see how people marveled at what Jesus said. Let's pray. God, help us to understand the words of Jesus today. Lord, you know, we know <laughs> that you want us to understand the words of Jesus. And Lord, it's by your spirit today that we'll know it. It's not by what I will say, but what your spirit will do to the words of Jesus himself as we engage them today. And I thank you for that. I pray that you would open our hearts and ears to understand your word and to be given such incredible marvel at it today. And Lord, help me just to be an instrument and a servant in your care today to preach your word. And I thank you for that privilege, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's start with a look at John chapter 7, verses 14 and 15. And we see that Jesus is teaching. And when I look for this question, whose words are these? Let's look at what it says here. Again, looking at, at not so much what he taught in the moment, but how people responded to it. Verse 14, John 7. But when it was now the midst of the feast, Jesus went up into the temple and began to teach. The Jews then were astonished. That's our marvel word, okay? In some translations actually be translated marveled that the Jews then were marveled, saying, how has this man become learned having never been educated. Now, it's clear they marveled at what Jesus was teaching in the temple. And as many of the marvels that we've encountered already and will through this summer, we will discover that when people marvel, it's typically not silent. It comes with, with an exclamation. It comes with a voice given to the emotion of the marveling that's been stirred within them. And here on this occasion, the Jews have a particular question because something doesn't add up in their minds as they witness the teaching of Jesus in this moment at the temple. You see, they're marveled by his words, but they don't understand how and why. It doesn't make sense that they would be marveled by one who is uneducated. You see, education was the typically respected source of the day. Not much unlike our day, right? And so to be educated by a scholar 
was therefore to be learned, this was the assumed and socially accepted route for anyone with authority to teach in the temple. But you see their question about Jesus. Marveled at what they're hearing, they understand that what they're hearing is, is significant, but what they don't understand is that this man hasn't been educated in the same way they have grown accustomed to seeing those teaching in the temple that have been credentialed as such. So they marvel at the source of his words. Jesus is uneducated, but yet learned. Well, let's see what happens next. Verses 16 and 17, we find that source indeed does matter. It mattered to Jesus, as we'll see in his own words. It mattered to those that were marveling at his words as they were hearing him in the temple. And in verse 16, it says, so Jesus answered them. Right? He had an answer to this sort of marveling question that they had about hearing him in regard to the source. And he said, my teaching is not mine, but his who sent me. If anyone is willing to do his will, he will know of the teaching, whether it is of God or whether I speak from myself. Jesus identified for them the source of his learning, the source of his education. Jesus didn't need to be educated by man's system of knowledge now, it, it's hard to grasp this for a moment, so hang with me, because we know that Jesus is God, but remember what we learned in Philippians when we were there for the Pursuit of Joy series, that Jesus stepped out of the privileges of heaven and became fashioned like a man. And so Jesus says here that his source, as he walks as a man in this life, his source is not upon his own knowledge, but on a knowledge greater than his, the knowledge of the Father, the knowledge of God in heaven. And Jesus does not speak on his own accord or from his own education or his own learning, but he speaks that which the Father gives him. And this is the God of all the universe, the creator himself, to which all knowledge begins and ends. So my friends, if you want to marvel at a source that is greater than any man could ever claim, then we marvel in that source from which Jesus spoke. The Father through the Son. How about another passage? That's just one example. If we turn from John 7 to Matthew 7, the last verses of that chapter, and by the way, they're the only words in three chapters, in the span of three chapters that aren't read, if you've got a red letter Bible. And if you've got a red letter Bible, that means that Jesus spoke all the words. So this comes after three chapters of capturing the very words of Jesus. We've already marveled at the source. Now listen to the response here in the end of chapter seven, verses 28 to 29. When Jesus had finished these words, the crowds were amazed. Another way of saying marveled. They were marveled at his teaching, for he was teaching them as one having authority and not as their scribes. This was a marvelous sermon, as I titled it. Why? If you know Matthew 5, 6, and 7, those three chapters, they're historically known as the Sermon on the Mount. As Jesus taught from a hillside and as the crowds had gathered and he taught on a variety of subjects. And after three chapters filled with the words of Jesus at the Sermon on the Mount, we find that those that had gathered to hear him, they were marveled. Now they use an interesting word, a word that we found last week, and it's that word authority again. They weren't just marveled at the source of what Jesus was speaking from, though it pertains to this. They were marveled at the authority with which he spoke. Don't we seek that in people that are going to speak? We, those who we will give our time and our attention to, whether they're speaking and we're listening, whether they've written a book and we're reading, whether they're internet expert, because there's plenty of those, right? I mean, again, if you're looking for someone who you're going to listen to and submit yourself to what their opinion is and what they have to say, you're looking for some substance of authority that makes you feel comfortable listening 
and engaging with their knowledge. Well, that was true of these people. And as they listened to Jesus speak, they marveled at his authority. Authority means, if you remember, I told you last week, it is both the privilege and capacity to speak on such matters. That's how authority is used here. Now, do you remember who the source was? John 7, Jesus said, I speak what the Father gives me. That's all knowledge in the universe. And so if Jesus speaking with that source, then he does have both the privilege and the capacity to speak about anything and everything that he wants, and it will be true and exactly what we need to know. They marveled at what he was saying, at the authority that his teaching carried. But did you notice what they said at the end? They said, this is one who has authority. And then, ooh, a bit of some some touchy words here. When they said, and not as their scribes. Do you ever wonder why the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the scribes, and the teachers of the law, why they hated Jesus? Well, here's a good clue as to the beginnings of that. Because the murmurings among the crowd that heard Jesus said, wow, this guy can teach. Man, this, that sermon was marvelous. Wow, this guy's got authority. But then they started to say, I never heard our scribes teach like this. I mean, the scribes, they're the people of their day who are the educated, the learned, the ones who are the experts with all authority. But listen to me, that was authority that was given by man. Now these folks are witnessing one who comes with authority from God. And there's a difference, and they recognized, even if they didn't understand yet, why they felt the way that they felt and why their heart and their mind were stirred so much within them to marvel at this man and his words. They knew there was a discrepancy between his teaching, the particular the authority of his teaching, with that of their most respected and educated teachers. That's awesome. What about the Sermon on the Mount? I don't have time unless you want to hang out for a while. So please, just view this bubble (laughs) that tells you all the content of the Sermon on the Mount. And while you do that, let me give you three highlights. One from each chapter. Because again, and that's why this is such a weird message, even for me to preach and probably for you to hear, it won't be marvelous, all right? Because it's not so focused on the teaching of Jesus, but how we respond and to see us. If, If I could today, instead of just giving you, wrapped up in 30 minutes the teaching of Jesus, and you say, man, that was good, That's not what I'm after. What I'm after is for you to leave here and say, man, I need to get after the teachings of Jesus because that's when I'll be marveled. Because if you come one Sunday or one day a week to be marveled by this guy, you'll be sorely disappointed. I do not have the words of life, but I know the one who does. And Jesus, if you will get with him Monday through Saturday and even on Sunday, because don't just take my word for it, you will be blessed tremendously and you will marvel. But listen, three highlights for me. How about chapter five, verse six? In that part of the Sermon on the Mount known as the Beatitudes, that blessed are the, and then Jesus goes on to say many things. My favorite in the list is verse six. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. That word means, and one of my favorite words, because Jackson taught me this word, when he says, because he uses it all the time when he says, I'm so satisfied. And I love that word. Man, if we hunger and thirst after righteousness, and that's where it begins, that's where marveling will start because we will find ourselves satisfied if that's the kind of hunger and thirst that we have. That's but one highlight. How about, this is my favorite highlight in the whole of the Sermon on the Mount. Chapter six, verse six, because I love that Jesus explores the topic of prayer in the Sermon on the Mount. And I love prayer. In fact, I believe it's my highest calling above preaching is praying. Without praying, there is no preaching, okay? But listen to me. Jesus says some things about prayer that sort of straighten the whole thing out for us. In chapter 6, verse 6, isn't that interesting? 5, verse 6, now 6, verse 6. He said this, and he said a lot about prayer, but it's my favorite part. He says, but when you pray, go into your inner room Close your door and pray to your father who is in secret, and your father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. Boy, there is the the promise of the reward that comes in the secret place of prayer. The real power of prayer is not here publicly in, in the place of worship. There's a place for that. It's okay and right and good that we pray here. 
But you know, often I'm busy thinking about what you guys think about what I'm praying because even when I'm preaching, I'm thinking about what you're thinking about my preaching, right? But when I'm alone in the inner room, whether I'm preaching or praying, ain't nobody telling me what they think about it. And my Father, God rewards me in that secret place. We don't need, Jesus went on in the sermon, I'm gonna preach a different sermon now, but Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount said, if you want the reward outside the closet, you can have it. You know what that reward is? That's people walking out the back of the church after the preaching saying, attaboy. That feels good, don't tell me that it does. But it ain't the same as God saying, son, I saw you preach today, and I appreciate your boldness to speak my truth. There's a difference in that. But that only comes in the private, secret, closet, inner room of prayer. That's why there's a prayer room on this campus. If you haven't been there, go find it. It's the most powerful room on this campus because people meet with Jesus and they meet with the Father through the Son in that place. All right, there's another highlight or this sermon will be too long. Chapter seven, verses 13 and 14, and this, we need to hear this. Jesus said, and he was so clear, the world needs to hear this because they don't believe it. Jesus said, enter through the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the way is broad that leads to destruction, and there are many who enter through it. For the gate is small and the way is narrow that leads to life. Jesus loved to use pictures so that we could understand, right? Narrow gate, narrow path, because there is only one way. There is only one name. And that's Jesus and what he did for us at the cross. The world says it doesn't matter what you believe as long as you believe something. All roads lead to heaven. Broad is the road. You can believe anything, do anything, just walk that path together. Everybody be kind to each other. We all end up at the same spot. Jesus said it doesn't work that way. Broad is the road. If you're carrying forward in that way, it's destruction. But narrow is the way. That's not an unloving message. That's not even, well, maybe it's an intolerant message. I don't know. The world loves tolerance, but it's a loving message because it's the truth. And love always is greater than tolerance. Because it says, come find the narrow way that is in Jesus Christ and be saved. Amen. That's the Sermon on the Mount. Can we marvel at that? That's just four verses in three chapters of which the crowd marveled. They said, this man has authority unlike any authority we have ever witnessed. And it's because the source was the Father, the God of all creation, the knowledge that we need. Well, there's more. I love this part. Matthew 22 I don't have time to go into all this, so you bring your questions later this week. Email me, text me, come sit in the office, whatever. Just not Wednesday, I'm doing stuff, okay? All right, Matthew 22, you ready? In Matthew 22, the Pharisees tried to trick Jesus with politics. Ugly. You don't even want me to talk about politics this morning, do you? You'd take it all to Facebook anyway, okay? All right, so here it is. Pharisees tried to trick Jesus with politics. Verses 15 to 22, and the dot, dots, dots means you gotta go read the rest of it later if you wanna know the controversy of it all. I'll get into it briefly. But it says, then the Pharisees went and plotted together how they might trap him in what he said. Okay, listen, the Pharisees didn't like Jesus because the people started to recognize that they were the con and Jesus was the truth. They did. They started to recognize these Pharisees have been, they've been pulling this over on our eyes this whole time. They, they got pretend authority. Jesus has God-given authority. Okay? So people started to recognize that. They started to get woke, right, if you want to use a cultural word. Okay? But listen, Jesus came under threat then of the Pharisees because he was the true threat to them. So they tried to trick him with politics. But look at verse 22. And hearing this, because the dot, 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 <laughs> have what Jesus had to say. And hearing this, they were... Amazed, that's a marvel word. They were marveled and leaving him, they went away. So listen, they tried to trick Jesus with politics and ended up getting marveled in it. They got one-upped by Jesus. Amen. You know what they tried to do? They attempted to trap Jesus with a question regarding taxes and the political sort of cloud around taxes, okay? And the potential for Jesus, regardless of what he answered, to offend all that were listening was great. Because no matter what he said, because here was the question, is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar? Because you see, those that were, were Jews, to pay taxes to Caesar meant you were given to Rome, and you didn't like Rome, because you really weren't free. Rome was sort of heavy-handed on them, right? Too much government control over what was going on for the Jews. So nobody wins. No matter what Jesus says, he's offending one side or the other, left or right, right? You get the picture. So what did Jesus do? Jesus simply responded that they had a responsibility to both. They had a responsibility to human governance, meaning Caesar. 
He even said, where's your coin? And he showed them Caesar on the coin. See, I'm getting into it too much. You need to go read it. And then he told them they also had a responsibility to God and spiritual governance. So they tried to trick him, but they themselves ended up marveled. They weren't the only ones in the trap there that tried to trick Jesus. Next up, were the Sadducees. See, the Pharisees were more sort of like official law, more the political entity of leaders. Sadducees were much more spiritual. They were more the, the theological leaders of the day. Not any better, still as twisted and corrupt, and tried, again, felt threatened by Jesus. So look, the Pharisees tried to trick Jesus with politics, so the Sadducees tried to trick Jesus with religion. Verse 23, on that day, so the same day as the Pharisees and their little trickster game, on that same day, the Sadducees, who say there is no resurrection, so that gives you an idea where they're coming from, so much for theology, right? Came to Jesus and questioned him, dot, dot, dot. That means you've got to read it later, but I'm going to tell you a little bit about it anyway. When the crowds heard this, they were astonished at his teaching. So once again, let's trick Jesus. Let's go a different route. Politics didn't work. Let's try the religious group. They try to trick him with religion, and everyone gets marveled. That's how it works. You mess with Jesus, you get marveled, Okay? That's how it goes down. But listen, here, Deuteronomy chapter 25. It, it explains this in the law, Deuteronomy 25. Steve, listen here, brother. Hey, I'm fired up today. I'll come find you. All right, no one's coming to church ever again. I'm sorry. All right, Deuteronomy 25. If a man dies childless, his brother has a responsibility to marry the widow. So here's the question the Sadducees had. They painted this concocted story of a lady who married a man and he died. So she became a widow, but this man had six brothers. And they all died leaving her a widow. And they said, when this lady gets to heaven, who's she married to? That was their ridiculous question that they brought to Jesus. And Jesus simply responded, you can read it for yourself, dot, 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 that the economy of heaven is different than the economy on earth. Honestly, you can go read about it and you'll find out. And then Jesus said, by the way, I'm not God of the dead, I'm God of the living, which is pretty cool too. They left, marveled. But there's more I want to tell you. Let me, let me get there. This is really what I want to see. Okay, because we see clearly that whether they were for Jesus or against him, whether they were pro-Jesus or anti-Jesus, whether they were listening to learn or they were listening to trick or to be critical, they all end up marveled. And if we listen, we'll end up marveled too. In Mark chapter 10, an amazing counter. And we find a lot of marveling and some not marveling going on. Watch this, Mark 10, verses 17 to 19. As he was setting out on a journey, that's Jesus. He's getting ready to leave, go somewhere, okay? A man ran up to him and knelt before him, it's very respectful, by the way, and asked him, good teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said to him, you know the commandments. Do not commit adultery, do not steal, do not bear false witness, do not defraud, honor your father and mother. So this man coming to Jesus, he has a, I don't want to call it a good question because in a moment I'm going to tell you it's a bad question. But he has a question for Jesus and it's not unlike a question that society and culture has had throughout history. Okay, and in, in fact, maybe it's not a good question. Maybe I can't call it that, but it's kind of the ultimate question I mean, did you hear what he asked Jesus? What shall I do to inherit eternal life? Can I tell you this? Every religion is basically centered around this very same question and seeking to answer the question. Every religion, I don't like the word religion, so I'm gonna give you something different in a moment, but every religion saying, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And they all have their steps that you must take. Step here and here and here and you'll be good to go. But many religions say step here, here, here and you might be good to go. That's not very certain, is it? And doesn't feel very good, by the way, either to know that you can do this, this, this and that and maybe still not inherit eternal life. So what's Jesus do? Jesus points him to the commandments. Jesus points him, if you will, to holiness in fact, holiness is always the standard. It's always the mark. It's always the starting point. And, and listen, holiness is necessary for eternal life. Amen. You see, what Jesus is really doing is telling this man that he's asking the wrong question. Not because he's focused on eternal life and how to get it. That's correct. 
It's when he says, what must I do? Thank you, George. To inherit eternal life. Because as we know, if we study the life of Jesus, that it's not what you do. It's not what I do. It's not what we do. It's what Jesus does. It's what Jesus has done. So he points him to holiness by showing him the Ten Commandments. How does the man respond? It says, verse 20 and 21, and he said to him, teacher, I have kept all these things from my youth up. Do you believe him? (laughs) Even if he was really good at it, watch what happens next. Looking at him, and this is so critical, looking at him, Jesus felt a love for him and said to him. Again, the world would miss that part in this. And they would say, Jesus being intolerant, you know, you just got to let the man believe something. Jesus, why would you send anybody to hell? He's rescuing this man because this man's headed for hell unless he meets Jesus, the Savior, who is the only one who can rescue him. So with love for this man, as Jesus sees him, he speaks truth into his life. And he says to him, one thing you lack, go and sell all you possess and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven and come follow me. My friends, how do you measure up to holiness? Have you ever measured yourself? Because again, that was an error that this man makes. His question was in error because it was too focused on self and his answer was in error because it was still focused on self. And he said, Jesus, look at my resume. I've done great from youth on up. The Ten Commandments, easy peasy, Jesus. But then you know what Jesus did to this man who thought he was doing it so well? Jesus pointed to a critical spot of weakness. What's your weakness? What's your vulnerability? Where do you fall short? And where is your sin? Are you able to set aside pride for a moment to allow Jesus to put his finger on the one thing? Man, I don't know where this guy came from, but Jesus pointing the finger at me, there's more than one thing. It doesn't matter one thing, 12 things, 87 things. We all fall short. And we need a savior. And it's not what must I do, and it's not look what I have done there's something else. But how did this man respond in 22, 10, 22 here of Mark? We don't find him marveling. It says, but at these words, he was saddened and he went away grieving for he was one who owned much property. Jesus hit a nerve. You see, not everyone marvels at the words of Jesus. It says that this man was saddened. I looked up the word because I thought I knew what sad meant. I thought it meant the tears that I feel, the emotion of brokenness when I experience it or unmet expectations, and it's kind of that. But saddened here, the Greek word, it means his enthusiasm dissipated. It means he came to Jesus so excited because he felt good about himself. He felt like he was somebody, but Jesus can probably just give me that one missing piece or he can confirm for me that I've been good enough, that my religion has sustained me and even saved me. That's what he was hoping for and he was enthusiastic about it. But all that dissipated when Jesus touched that one area of weakness. What else does it say about him? That then he went away grieving That means sorrow to the point of pain. You know, sadly, this man didn't submit to what Jesus was saying. Couldn't get past a look at his own self and see the Savior. And left disappointed and even at pain. But there's more to this, and I'm almost done. Because then there are those that did marvel at this encounter. In the very next verse, verse 23, it says, in Jesus looking around, he's still looking, and I love that. Jesus seeing and understanding and loving and speaking truth. And looking around said to his disciples, how hard it will be for those who are wealthy to enter the kingdom of God. And the disciples were amazed at his word. They were marveled. Now, the man who came with the question, who all he could see was self and was offended by what Jesus had to say about his self, he left saddened and grieving, but the disciples marveled. Now, not yet necessarily in a good way, 
marveled as they heard then Jesus describe for them that this man's weakness, not getting past his own sufficiency in his wealth, that it would be hard for him to enter the kingdom of heaven. Listen to me, holiness is hard. We should be confronted with holiness, and in holiness we should be, oh my God, I'm not, and I can't be, and will always fail at my effort to be made holy. You see, it's difficult to be saved, friends, if, listen to me, if we are merely focused on our own effort and our own provision in the matter, if we are coming to religion, if we're coming to Jesus, if we're coming to the Bible, if we're coming to this church today in this sanctuary and saying, what must I do to be saved, then we're gonna be saddened, disappointed, and grieved. Because being saved that way is not just hard, It's an impossibility. So what happened? Well, they got even more marveled, which I know doesn't make any grammatical sense, but it feels good to say it. And it makes it stick. And they were even more marveled. Look, but Jesus answered again, verse 24, the end of it. But Jesus answered again and said to them, children, how hard it is to enter the kingdom of God. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. We've heard that statement before, right? And it always sort of shocked us, like, what in the world does he mean? And listen, Jesus doubles down on what he said, that holiness is hard if it's self-driven holiness. If it's, I'll try harder, I'll do better, I'll follow all the roles. In fact, paint the line over there for the roles and I'll step back 10 feet and that's how good I'll be at. That's what the Pharisees tried to do, except secretly they broke them all and forced you to do them all. Listen, how difficult it is to be saved. Again, if focused on our own effort, our own provision in the matter, if it's what must I do to be saved, instead, Jesus, Jesus is the answer. Do you want to see it? Because here's what the disciples did then. As they even marveled more, because that's what it says, they were even more astonished, and they said to him, and here's the point. I need you to hear this, and really, I'm almost done. Then who can be saved. I mean, do you see the disciples' frustration? And they've been following Jesus, but they know that what Jesus just said to this man that made him grieved and made him leave in pain, that they too, likewise, how hard can it be? No one can be saved, Jesus. If this is the level that you're calling us to, if it's holiness that is required, we can't do it and we all fall short. And can I say to you that as they threw up their hands in disgust in this giving up moment, I say, amen. And I say that's the moment that each and every one of us must come to. My friends, the greatest marvel is this. How can a man like me be saved? Notice what I didn't say. How can a man like you be saved? How can a woman like you, even though it's true, But it's not about what I think about you, it's what I know about myself, and it's what each and every one of you sitting here today or watching from home knows about your own self. Who then can be saved? Well, do you want the answer? They said, then who can be saved? And Jesus, looking at them, here he is looking again. I love it. I imagine him just looking around at the disciples, making eye contact with each and every one, because the moment was ripe. And the harvest was ready. Who then can be saved? Looking at them, Jesus said, with people it is impossible, but not with God. For all things are possible with God. It is impossible for the holy to be made holy by their own selves, by their own effort. But there is one One with supernatural intervention who has made it possible. Impossible, by the way, means exactly what it means. It can't be done. It means there is no way, but then we run into God. We run into the Savior. We run into the person of Jesus who at the cross has made a way for us to have holiness. And the word possible, when it says all things are possible with God, it means not only capable, but capable with power the dunamis word, which is where we get dynamite. So my friends, it is possible, but only if we change the question. 
You see, the question did change in the passage. Can you marvel at that? Because the question changed from what shall I do to be saved to who then can be saved? You see, it sounds so subtle to us, but it's huge because in one sense, the man, the person got out of the way. And in that moment, God is the Savior that we need. So last thing to you, my friends, have you experienced the marvelous words of Jesus? That's just but a few of them, but it's Jesus' words that we need. Let's pray. God, help us to hunger and thirst for your word. Lord, not Pastor Dan's word, not that author or that TV preacher or that political opinion, Lord, whatever it might be, but let us, Lord, go to the depths of your word. Lord, let us take daily the privilege to read and to study, to meditate and to pray through the scriptures. Lord, that we might marvel at your truth. Lord, that it might do for us what we cannot do for ourselves. Just lead us to the Savior, Jesus Christ. Lord, if there's anybody today that is here that doesn't know the Savior, still trying through religion to what must I do to inherit eternal life, may today, Lord, they reach that exasperated point of how then can this man be saved? And Lord, is that question and the fog from it rolls away that they see Jesus at the cross where he died for the sins of all the world. That we, by faith in Jesus, can be made holy. Thank you, Lord, for the good news of the gospel. We love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
Listen, there are a lot of impossibilities that are here today. Men and women, boys and girls that had no power by which they could save their own self. Many, if you would listen to them tell their story, their testimony, they would speak to you of their efforts and of years of which they had tried. Till one day they said, how then can I be saved? And Jesus swooped in as they found out that the Savior had done the saving. My friends, will you marvel today at an amazing God and an amazing Savior. I love you guys. Have a great Sunday, and I'll see you later this week. Thank you so much.